1987, 7.2 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births occurred in the United States. In 2014, that number more than doubled to 18 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births in 2014. Now this is a time period several decades after childbirth has moved from the home setting into the hospital setting. So what's happening here in America? Comparatively, you can see the United Kingdom, they've been holding pretty steady since the 90s at 8.9 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. But in America, in 2016, related to preeclampsia alone, 50 to 70 women died. Why is this? Well, about 700 women died total related to pregnancy and labor and delivery complications in the United States. But that number or that risk for death is three to four times as high for black mothers. So if you take that 700 women, you're looking at roughly four to 500 of those women are black. Well, what does that say about what we're doing and the disparities that exist here in America? In the 1980s, they said, oh, well, they're poor, low socioeconomic status, poor lifestyle choices, crack, cocaine, crime, low education. Those are all the reasons why that particular group is experiencing those particular hardships. 2011 to 2014, the Centers for Disease Control released a study related to the, the surveillance of maternal mortality in the US. You'll see that in white women, the rate is 12.4 uh, deaths per 100,000 live births. In women of other races, that number increases to 17.8 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. In black women, that number is 40.0 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. These are mothers, these are sisters, these are aunts, these are friends. In America, we see them as numbers. Anyone know her? only the greatest of all time to ever play women's tennis. <laughs> She's also a new mother, but no amount of money or privilege that her money may have granted her allowed her voice to be heard when she went in to have her own daughter. After delivering her daughter, she began to have difficulty breathing, and she reported this to the nurse immediately, knowing that she herself had a history of blood clots. She said, what I need is I need a CT scan and I need a heparin drip. The nurse told her, no, that's probably just those narcotics from the surgery. You'll be fine, it's okay. She continued to experience these difficulties and you might imagine her anxiety is increasing by this point. And she says, I need a CT and a heparin drip. And by the way, I do need to see my physician. So the physician comes in and he talks to her, you know, hears out her symptoms, and he said, okay, nurse, well, let's get, a, let's get an ultrasound, but we're gonna ultrasound her calves, because some of you who may be familiar, uh, DVTs, or uh, deep vein thrombosis, usually occurs right behind the knees. You'll have calf pain. For neglecting the fact she was complaining she was having difficulty breathing. So finally, with persistence and advocacy, self-advocacy, they took her to get a CT scan. Her lungs were full of blood clots. They immediately transferred her to the ICU, started a heparin drip, and she's here today to continue to play the sport that she loves. The woman pictured above, this is Shalon Irving. Like us, she's everyday, working class, professional woman, but she's not here to hold her own daughter anymore. Shalon Irving was an epidemiologist for our United States Senate, so sorry, Center for Disease Control, and her voice was not heard. She had her daughter 
and then she went home two days discharge, which typically for a C-section could be three to four days. But she went home after two days per request, her too having had a history of blood clots and high blood pressure. A few days once home, she started began to really feel those symptoms. And for those of you in the audience, you know, sometimes the recovery doesn't really start until after you get home. So she went to her primary care physician and she began to plead, I'm not feeling well, my blood pressure's elevated, blood pressure's running 178 over upper 100s. They're like, well, this is normal. This is normal for you, you have high blood pressure, it'll be okay, send her home. She goes back because things are getting worse. A few days later, complaining of the similar symptoms, but now she has the complications of the excessively high blood pressure to go with it, on top of the fact she just had a baby. And so they prescribe her a new hypertensive medication and send her home. Within hours of returning home later into that night, she died in her own home. Recognize this person. Well, that's me. That's me in 2016. My husband and I, we went in for what was supposed to be a routine, unmedicated, no significant medical history, childbirth experience. And having been a labor and delivery nurse for 14 plus years, I know that things happen. We call it the nurse curse. But I know that things happen. So I ended up in a C-section, emergency C-section, um, with our fourth son. And um, that was the pretty routine part, actually, for a labor and delivery nurse. It was after that, where it was midnight, my husband and I were up, you know, he had just got the last little sweets from the midnight snack bar. And so I was like, but something's not right. Can you call the nurse? The nurse came in, and long story short, I ended up having postpartum hemorrhage, losing 75% of my blood volume, 2,800 milliliters of blood. I go back and I think about that nurse curse and say, well, maybe that was it. But after preparing for this talk, doing the research, I kept having this lingering thought. If it had not been for my understanding of policy and procedure, standards of practice and protocol, if it had not been that I had been a high-risk antepartum nurse, a labor and delivery nurse, and a postpartum and newborn care nurse for this longevity, if it had not been for the fact that I leaned over my own bed rail and programmed my own IV pump to the postpartum hemorrhage protocol in the facility where we were sisters uh, linked, that might not have been the same outcome. I might not have been here to share this story with you today. Now that's a lot, it's pretty heavy. My husband would normally say, hey, land the plane right here, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't land the plane without sharing with you how a generation of unconscious bias and purposeful or unintentional ignoring the voice of the underserved and the underrepresented can affect those to come. This is my mother. My mother and I, uh, I was about, mm, I would say five or six this age. My mother comes from a bustling, very loud Texan family of 10 siblings with her mom and dad. And she wanted at least three children of her own. Unfortunately, I'm the only one. Well, maybe not so unfortunately. I mean, I am doing a TED talk today. So, <laughs> but having said that, um, my mom was one of those statistics of the 1980s. Huge family, low income, low education, poor access to health care. When she went into the hospital, the county hospital in Houston, Texas at the time, and she complained of severe bleeding, which she had suffered from not being able to have access to health care, affordable health care, immediate sterilization was the first option for this 22-year-old black female. Removing her uterus, otherwise known as a hysterectomy. And so then there's me. So some might say, well, you know, this is something that can be easily explained. It can be easily characterized or marginalized. But Harvard Kahn alumni 
has done research that says America is failing its black mothers. As a matter of fact, Dr. Neil Shaw is just blatant with it and said there's nothing else to say but that when black women make the same complaint and the same concern, treatment is often delayed or ignored. So what do we do? What do we do in these circumstances? This is my mom now. She defied those stereotypes. She defied those stereotypes. And plus, I had to put this in here because that 80s Jericho photo, you know, <laughs> had to balance it out a little bit. But she went on to become an executive for Shell Oil Corporation in Houston, Texas. And then after she put me through a very expensive college education, for which Dr. Davidson has offered a great alternative, um, <laughs> she went on to reinvest in the people who invested in her, and she's now serving as an administrator with her MBA in Houston, Texas. So much like my mom and the people that know me, I always see challenges as an opportunity for change. After that harrowing ordeal that I experienced in childbirth, I had a registered nurse who came into my home. I was in the hospital for five days. Registered nurse came into my home and checked on me two days after being home. I'd been on oxygen and so on and so forth because of my blood level being so low. She ma made sure that me and the baby were cared for. She did early interventions and, and assessments. She checked on my incisions. She checked on my mental and my physical well-being. And by the way, making sure that managing four children and a husband wasn't too overwhelming for this recovering mother. <laughs> so having said that, I said, you know what? I can make a difference. And a mother serenity RN was birthed exactly one year from when I had my own child, September 8th, 2018. So I challenge you guys, what is it that you can do to be the change in these challenging circumstances? Well, I tell you what, be an advocate first. Be an advocate in your own homes. Be an advocate in your community and be an advocate with the insurance companies. Ask them, ask them, do you offer this service to me? Is this something that's accessible? And if not, then where can I get it? Right here in the state of Colorado, we're working to make that change a reality for every woman. Because we can't always impact how other people see us, but through education, self-advocacy, we can empower those in the impacted communities so that they're not only seen, but that we are heard. Thank you.